Hi, everyone. It's about five minutes past the hour, so we're going to get started. I'm sure we'll have a few latecomers who are coming in, the, the dreaded post-lunch session here. Um, uh, this will be recorded, so for your friends and colleagues who made the mistake of not coming here today, you'll be able to share them the, the YouTube link when that's live, and we'll be sending that out at some point. We have a really great conversation lined up today, and I'm just really glad to be joined by these three incredible experts. And I, my name is Carl Robichaud. I'm at Longview Philanthropy. I work on nuclear weapons policy. And one of my goals within this community is try to create better conversations between the folks in this community that are working on catastrophic risk reduction and the folks who are in the existing nuclear policy community inside and outside of government, because we just have a lot to learn from each other. And I think it's going to be a really rich conversation today. Um, so let me introduce our panel here. Before I do, I want to say that immediately after this session, in room 308, we will have office hours with all of these speakers. So if you don't get a chance to ask your question, or if you have a secret question you want to ask on the side, that's a good time to come do it. Um, we also have a great session lined up tomorrow. Um, my colleague Matthew Gensel will be facilitating a panel with Tong Zhao and with Bill Drexel to experts on Chinese policy. That issue will look at great power conflict as well as nuclear weapons policy. So you may also be interested in dropping in on that session tomorrow. Um, so today we have with us Francesca Giovannini, uh, Executive Director of the Project on, the Manage Project on Managing the Atom at the Harvard Kennedy School. She is also an adjunct professor of technology and public policy at the Fletcher School and she's the director of the MacArthur Harvard Research Network on rethinking deterrence. Um, she has also worked at the United Nations, at the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, um, uh, as a PhD from Oxford, and leads this ESODARCO uh, conference as well, which you'll have a chance to, to mention later on. Um, we have Heather Williams on your far left. Uh, director of the Project on Nuclear Issues, affectionately known as PONY. Uh, that's at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She is also co-chair of the Harvard Deterrence Network, leading group on arms control and emerging technology. So how do new technologies affect this project of arms control we've been involved in? Um, and she mostly works in D.C., but she commutes from Boston because, as she claims, it is the greatest city on earth. So that may be a question for the audience at some point. I don't know, you can <laughs> discuss that. Uh, and we have James Acton. He is the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's currently finishing a book on nuclear escalation risks created by developments in non-nuclear technology and doctrine. And he's the author of the international security article, Escalation by Entanglement. So you'll want to check that out. Uh, and, I'm told, he was once brought breakfast by Patrick Stewart. Today is October 28th, and that's a really special day in world history. In 1962, on October 27th, we were in the middle of this Cuban Missile Crisis, and a lot of people have said that that is the most dangerous day in human history. You had three or four different incidents on October 27th, each of which, if they had gone wrong, could have led to nuclear war, which could have led to 500 million, 700 million people dead, and who knows what the consequences would have been after that. And on October 28th, there was a secret deal that was struck between Kennedy and Khrushchev to end the Cuban Missile Crisis. And that deal was to trade the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, the removal of those missiles in return for the removal of the missiles in Cuba that had triggered the crisis. And so today is one of the great, an anniversary of one of the great days in history. Um, and I think the nature of that deal, there are a couple things about it that we should remember. One, it took some real courage to come to an agreement from this moment of an intense crisis to be able to put something out there and to take a risk, <clears throat> that's pretty extraordinary.
But the other thing is that that deal was secret. And I, it wasn't revealed till 1988 that that deal was struck. I think there had been some rumors about it before then, but they kept that deal secret. And because of that, the story and the lesson that we took from the Cuban Missile Crisis in many ways was all wrong. In the US, we took this view that when you're facing a nuclear crisis, you can't blink, you can't back down, you gotta be strong. In the Soviet Union, they took the lesson that we had a numerical disadvantage during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the only way we're not gonna get bullied next time is by building up our arms. And so there's a lot of stuff in this space that we don't know and we may not know until later, and hopefully we have leaders with a cool head who can prevail and that we don't find ourselves in crises where the stakes are that high we're making decisions under duress and under extreme time pressure. And so that brings us to our first question, which is about how we might end in, how about we might end up in another nuclear crisis and how nuclear weapons might be used. Because the presumption is that nuclear deterrence generally works, right? You may be deterred from engaging in certain conventional aggression or nuclear use because the other side has nuclear weapons, so you're never going to get into a nuclear war, right? Well, our panelists today have discovered, have, have researched and discussed and studied a number of scenarios in which that may not be the case. And I think we'll start with Ukraine and Russia. So, Francesca, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you see this crisis. What do you see as the implications for nuclear deterrence? for arms control, for nuclear disarmament, and uh, you know, if a nuclear weapon is used in this crisis, how do we get there and how do we avoid that? Thank you, Carl, and good afternoon, everyone. Since I'm taking the floor for the first time, first, let me thank Effective Altruism, uh, this incredible global community for inviting me. It never happened to me that I am the oldest, both as a participant as and as a speaker. So I want to thank you all for inviting a representative of the geriatric community to be here <laughs> and addressing you today. And as you can see differently from my youngest colleagues, I still use pen and paper, which I'm sure many of you are not too familiar with. But you see cyber attacks, no problem with this. <laughs> now, I think, you know, I want to connect with what uh, your great introduction was. So there are many things in this nuclear space which we don't know. And so I say often to my students, you know, when you confront a shocking event like a war, it is just human instinct to be wanting to know how does it end. But I think the real response, the right, right answer is we don't know yet. Right? It's still a very fluid situation and conflicts go in phases, right? It's an acute phase of open violence followed by, you know, a stalemate, a regrouping, and then counteroffensive. So we have gone in this war through a series of phases that in my view were particularly risky. And let me open with three observations in particular about the Ukraine, the Ukraine war, but in general also about the nuclear risk we are confronting. Every single time we have a nuclear weapon state, involved in a crisis, there is always an underlying nuclear risk somewhere. In this crisis in particular, the Russian Federation was the one that actually made explicit the nuclear dimension of this crisis very early on. You will remember the very first two or three weeks where Putin talked immediately about nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence, he put the forces on high alert. So the Russian Federation made it very explicitly that this was a conflict that was both a regional conflict but potentially a global conflict. But Ukraine, in my view, posed to the Russian Federation also a very interesting strategic dilemma, and I wrote in my bulletin piece about this. When you hear Putin talking about Ukraine as the very deep identity of the Russian Federation, right? In February 24, 2022, he comes out and he said, Ukrainians are not just neighbors, right? We are, these are our brothers. And he talks about really the cradle of the Russian culture in Ukraine is signaling two very interesting things. The Russians cannot lose this war because this is very much identity driven, but at the same time, they can't destroy a country that actually belongs to them or they perceive to be fundamentally the, the origin of their very culture. And so you have seen a very schizophrenic attempt by the Russians to fight and at the same time deter. Right? And so I think the Ukrainians really pose a very interesting question. How do you fight a war that you cannot lose against a country that you cannot destroy? 
And I think that has been very evident in this sort of very ambivalent reaction that Putin um, has had. We have had acute moments of crisis. I think last year in September, you probably some, some of you remember when Biden went in t on TV and said, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. And Jake Sullivan, his national security advisor, you know, met with the Russians. I think that intelligence must have picked up this idea that, look, the Russians were in fact considering it. And we were also slightly closer, in my view, to a more acute risk this June. When you had, in fact, you know, this sort of march to Moscow by Prigozhin, right, and the Wagner Group, and at the same time you had the counter-offensive strategy of the Ukrainians that were actually picking up steam. So the risk is higher when the Russians are on the defense or when you have a real, real clash within the domestic arena of Russia. But I want to make a couple of uh, other points and then I'll close here. Um, I think today we are in a less risky moment, although let's remember we can never take anything for granted. But I think we are in a less risky moment for three or four reasons. The first one is the counteroffensive of the Ukrainians. Yes, it is working, it is moving, but has not been as much in success as, in my view, many in the West would have liked to see. So the Russians are less on the defense, in my view, that, that few months ago. But then there is a political opening for the Russians that is really important and is happening here in the United States. Presidential election year. Putin just needs to <coughs> wait off. And if Trump gets elected to the White House, he might have reasons to believe that, look, Ukraine will be given to the Russian Federation. Congress has shown very clearly a sort of Ukraine fatigue, and the idea of dysfunctionality within the United States might make the Russians believe that, look, we just have to wait, and the West at some point will give up. The final point is the Russians have been incredibly successful in securing new weapons. The Iranian deal, the North Korean deal, all demonstrate that, look, the Russians have a market that can continue to supply their war. But the final point is this. No matter how this war ends, the costs have already been astronom astronomical for the global nuclear order, right? Arms control prospects for the Russians, I think we, we, are, we are looking into 10, 15 years of complete stagnation on the formal arms control. But either we'll talk about you know, potential new forms, but imagine if Congress will really want to get a deal you know, with Putin, right? So until Putin remains in power, I think the prospect of an arms control are almost zero. The second is I think we are going to see also a change in the Russian nuclear posture. They were already reliant on nuclear weapons, but what you're seeing here is dismantlement of some norms that the Russians believe to be very important. Look at what is happening with nuclear testing, right? The idea now of de-ratifying the CTBT to show that, look, we don't actually even care about the multilateral nuclear diplomacy, right? We have other things that we want to prioritize. And the final point that to me is really important is that the nuclear community itself is going to be very divided in the lessons we are going to draw from Ukraine. Some of us do find, a, yet again, a confirmation that nuclear deterrence is the way to go. <coughs> nuclear weapons is the only weapon that can protect you. And some others believe that, look, we have gone too close yet again to a, another Cuban missile crisis. And we can't risk it. So we just need to disarm. Last point, I don't believe, and I really close with this, the only thing I don't believe is going to happen is a narrative that I hear over and over. I don't think that the Ukrainian war will actually sparkle a proliferation cascade. I don't think you will see like, you know, tens of countries running to get nuclear weapons. I think this is a simplistic argument, and maybe in the Q&A we can talk more about what's, why, why is the case. But again, I think in the long term the costs are going to be really, really high. Oh, thank you. And you, can, uh, you're, you had an article in the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists which lays out some of these arguments if people want to check that out. Um, does anyone want to respond specifically on Russia or the next question I'm going to ask is about China? China. Yeah. I might come in on Russia if that's, yeah, if that's okay um, and, and leave China for James. Um, I also really want to thank you, Carl, and, and the whole um, EA community. This is my first time coming to an EA conference and interacting with this crowd. It's just been a really positive experience, so, so thank you so much. It's also nice to be in Boston and be able to sing Boston's praises and not have to hide my stripes. <laughs> um, but to this question of Ukraine and you know how serious is the risk, how serious should we take it, I, I agree with Francesca's starting point. It's really important to bring a degree of humility to this question. 
nobody knows what Vladimir Putin is thinking. Nobody knows what the people around him are telling him. Um, and so that makes this a, a really thorny research question, <coughs> to, to be honest. Um, a, a, a CSIS, we actually just finished a major study on the role of nuclear um, rhetoric, nuclear exercises, nuclear activities, nuclear threats. Um, since the war began, and we, and we ended up with, I think, over 500 data points. The study comes out in about two weeks. Um, we also mapped how NATO and the West responded, so you can see the action-reaction cycle and what it means for escalation dynamics. Um, but the, the kind of bottom line of the study really is that we, we absolutely should take Putin's nuclear threats seriously. Um, however, those threats are clearly tied to what's happening on the battlefield. And so when, you know, the question is, when should we worry? I would get worried when they're facing significant battlefield losses, um, but perhaps the longer term, you know, obviously nuclear use would be, would be um, terrible and that's a very acute threat. The longer term thing that I worry a lot about has been the br complete breakdown of guardrails throughout this war. Um, it's the, you know, it's, it's um, de-ratifying the CTBT, it's violating existing arms control agreements, it's um, really undermining a lot of the existing nuclear norms, and so that's one of the big takeaways from our study. I'm um, just kind of quickly give you a preview of some of the other findings that we had. Um, so as I said, the, the first one really is that these nuclear threats are tied to what happens on the battlefield. And so those threats in September, October, um, when there was also this narrative that Russia was pushing about Ukraine potentially using a dirty bomb, uh, the New York Times has reported that Russian military leaders were thinking about nuclear use. Like that was directly tied to what was happening on the ground. Um, another uh, finding that we had was that for, <coughs> for Russia, nuclear deterrence, strategic deterrence, looks like it worked in some ways. The, the nuclear deterrent strategic objective was to prevent NATO and Western boots from getting on the ground. So far that has actually been successful. Mm -hmm. um, it has not completely deterred kind of a slow ramping up of military support, but if that was Putin's overarching objective and the reason behind these nuclear threats, so far, it, it is actually working. With that said, NATO's nuclear umbrella also is potentially having a, a successful impact. Um, but so, I, and then I think the last point from the study I'll flag um, is that since that October event, um, or the, the, you know, in October when things got a little bit spicy, um, it, it looks like. Um, Putin really shifted away in terms of how he was using nuclear threats and nuclear rhetoric. He was less vocal. Other people in the administration, in his, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it an administration, um, other people in the Russian government um, were more vocal. And instead, it seems like Russia's strategy has become undermine those guardrails. Like, this is not an accident, de-ratifying these agreements. It is intentionally manipulating the risk of nuclear use. Um, and, you know, I, I, just to be a little bit controversial to last point, so to push back a little bit on some of the earlier comments maybe, you know, I think, I think you're right to um, note the anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, would also point out the Cuban Missile Crisis and that heightened sense of risk, it actually inspired some really ambitious arms control efforts in the aftermath of it, right? So limited test ban treaty, nuclear non-proliferation treaty, potentially also things like SALT and the ABM agreement. Um, and so, you know, whenever this war ends, may it be soon, my hope is that because we have this more acute awareness of nuclear risk and nuclear threats, that we turn that into some sort of positive rebuilding of guardrails. We are going to have to rebuild the entire arms control structure. Um, and then the final point, I, I, um, would, I think I take a slightly different um, perspective than Francesca in terms of proliferation risks that you know, ultimately depends on how the war ends, obviously. Um, that, that's really gonna be significant. But what I've been hearing from a lot of Ukrainians um, <clears throat> is a very committed interest in pursuing nuclear weapons. I, I had a young Ukrainian student recently said to me, Heather, how do you think the NPT is gonna respond when we pursue nuclear weapons after we win the war? And he was dead serious. Um, and and it, from a Ukrainian perspective, you, you can kind of see that. I said, well, what if you get a nuclear umbrella? Well, you didn't respect your our security assurances to us last time. Why would we trust you again? And so I think, um, I hope Francesca is right. Um, I think just, you know, it does depend on a lot of different factors, but I do think we need to kind of revisit a lot of the proliferation risks as all those guardrails are also falling off. So we have this war in process and a lot of the implications will determine, will be, will be determined by what happens next and how it ends. And that story, it's too soon to write that. Yep. And in the midst of this active war and now the crisis in the Middle East, in the background, we have this confrontation between the United States and its allies and China. And James, you've given a lot of thought to this question. Um, how does that conflict play out in the Western Pacific? 
What is the role of nuclear weapons, and what are some of the risks there? <clears throat> Thanks, Carl, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Patrick Stewart was kind of a big deal in my 20s. <laughs> um, we've so far been focusing on deliberate escalation. Russia's afraid of losing the war, and it uses nuclear weapons to try to spark a political crisis, to terrify Ukraine into backing down, to terrify us into pressuring Ukraine to back down. I want to focus on a different risk in the US-China context of inadvertent escalation. To be clear, both deliberate and inadvertent escalation are risks. I think they're both risks in both the China context and the Russia context, but I think governments are much less focused on, the, on an inadvertent escalation. And this is where neither side judges nuclear use to be in its interests, but because the two sides are unable to agree upon limits for a war, escalation occurs anyway. And to my mind, developments in technology are uh, uh, spurring this risk of inadvertent escalation. So in satellites around the world, the US has a number of early warning satellites. In the Cold War, the, these were, were designed in previous generations exclusively to detect nuclear weapons. Today, the same early warning satellites detect incoming nuclear weapons were they to be fired, but also play a huge role in conventional war fighting. You know, for example, detecting um, non-nuclear ballistic missiles so that regional missile defenses can shoot them down. This film of entanglement, as I call it, I think is a, is a significant driver of nuclear risk. And the kind of scenario I worry about is in a US-China conventional conflict over Taiwan. Imagine that US regional missile defenses have proven effective at shooting down China's non-nuclear ballistic missiles. One of the things that Chinese experts have said the government might do in that situation, and that I think would be highly consistent with Chinese doctrine, would be to take uh, shots at these early warning satellites. But they are the same early warning satellites that the US would use to detect an incoming nuclear attack against the homeland. So from the US perspective, this, prepar this attack against US satellites looks like Chinese preparations for a nuclear war. Under the Trump administration, US declaratory policy explicitly threatened to use nuclear weapons in the event of non-nuclear attacks against nuclear command and control. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, the Biden administration did not repeat that threat explicitly, though it didn't rule it out either. But the fact that you know, the Trump administration threatened to use nuclear weapons in response to a non-nuclear attack against command and control, I think gives you a sense of how seriously we would view it and a sense of the potential here for inadvertent escalation. Thanks. Um, Heather, did you have any uh, thoughts on that specifically? No. That's okay. So <laughs> I, I approach China with an even d greater degree of humility <laughs> um, and, um, and leave it to, to James. I think he, he's covered the risks really so well. So this is, yeah, this is one of the ways in which technological change could lead to some bad outcomes um, as some of the things we may have taken for granted in terms of the differentiation between nuclear operations and conventional operations that has existed throughout the Cold War. Yeah. It's different now, and space is a more is more mm -hmm. contested. Um, there's more entanglement, and oftentimes you have people who are planning to fight and win a conventional war. They're not necessarily in conversation with the people who are doing nuclear war planning, and we know that that's the case in the United States. I'm equally concerned about what's happening in China, in Russia, in North Korea. Mm -hmm. And in a conventional war, the pressures that those leaders may be under. Um, so it's a really thorny problem, and it's one of the reasons I think we can't be complacent about this issue. Okay. Um, we've talked about Russia, Ukraine, China. We should probably also talk about North Korea and India and Pakistan. Um, we're limited on time here. Clearly, these are conflicts with a <coughs> nuclear dimension. If anyone wants to talk about those specifically, we can do that in the Q&A, but we're gonna move on now. Um, I wanna remind people you can post questions in the app and up upvote questions, so the more good questions we have, I can, I can, I can pinpoint those and uh, flag those for our panel. Um, so if I understand the situation, um, the US updated its targeting strategy around 2012 to reflect the laws of armed conflict. 
and that represents something of a change um, in the way the US did nuclear planning and nuclear targeting and moved towards targeting military sites and minimizing collateral damage. And in my view, that's a, that's a welcome change, but it also creates some problems, especially as the number of nuclear weapons in the world rises and as China embarks on its nuclear modernization program. Um, so, uh, James, you pre present an argument on nuclear targeting and U.S. nuclear policy. It's in the most recent version, most recent issue of Foreign Affairs. Um, maybe you could lay that out for us and we can have a little conversation about that. Yeah, this is, this is one of my more controversial arguments. So, U.S. targeting is normally described as counterforce, and I think most people see that as uh, a good thing. What they think that means is the U.S. targets adversaries, nuclear forces, nuclear command and control, leadership. That seems like a pretty good thing, right? Because, you know, you're avoiding cities, and maybe you can avoid nuclear winter and the absolute worst aspects of a nuclear war. I think that's profoundly wrong. Um, the first issue with nuclear targeting right now is it is driving a three-way arms race that I think is likely to prove unstoppable. Um, as China's nuclear arsenal gets bigger, which it is, uh, as, as the US fears rightly or wrongly that China and Russia might gang up with each other against the US, STRATCOM, for the first time, U.S. Strategic Command, which is responsible for nuclear war fighting, is starting to seriously think about fighting a two-front nuclear war. We think about fun things right in the nuclear community. <laughs> um, and their philosophy is basically that the more nuclear weapons China and Russia have, if we have to be able to target both of them simultaneously, we need more nukes in response. But the inevitable consequence of that is that China and Russia, who will, be who will be worried that we could destroy their nuclear forces, would build up in response, which by the logic of counterforce targeting, then requires us to build up in response. I think this is undesirable, both because an arms race drives up tensions, increases, makes war more likely, and because the more nuclear weapons there are, the more likely nuclear winter becomes in the event that the proverbial hits the fan. Secondly, for reasons that you know, this is a long, complicated argument, but basically the argument as to why counterforce targeting is good as to why it enhances deterrence is because if we can limit the damage we would suffer in a nuclear war, it becomes more credible for us to make nuclear threats and we can scare the other side. Um, in my view, this argument is profoundly wrong because we cannot meaningfully limit the damage we would suffer in a nuclear war. Um, from a kind of EA perspective, there is a big difference between 100 cities being destroyed and 10 cities being destroyed. From the perspective of the president, those two things are equally un unthinkable outcomes. Thirdly, counterforce targeting is deeply escalatory. By aiming at their nuclear forces, we incentivize them to use their nuclear forces before we can destroy them. So counterforce targeting, in my opinion, makes nuclear war more likely. And finally, and this is the kicker, and I cannot emphasize this enough, there are many counterforce targets in cities. Count, don't get the idea that counterforce targeting is, is, is attacking remote nuclear weapons in the middle of the desert or the middle of the tundra or wherever it is, okay? Command and control facilities are in cities. Leadership facilities are in cities. War supporting industry is in cities. Conventional military bases are close to cities. These are all things that the US targets. These are all things that advocates say of counterforce targeting, say the US should target. And whereas I think we would avoid targets in cities at the beginning of a war, in the event that a nuclear war escalated, do not think cities would, would be spared because they wouldn't. So for all of those reasons, the argument that I'm making in foreign affairs and in a follow-up piece I have coming out hopefully next week in War on the Rocks is we should abandon counterforce targeting. My preference for the alternative is what I'm now calling CMI targeting, which is attacking conventional military forces and war-supporting industry. Like, I don't like this idea, but it seems to me the least bad alternative out there. Mm. Heather, Francesca, do you agree? Do you agree with this argument? Well, first, uh, I'm going to be academic and challenge the premise. <laughs> um, I, 
I actually think that we should just abandon the counterforce, countervalue paradox, all to, or um, kind of binary altogether. Um, and so that's why I, I would say I agree with James's approach and by offering this new, this new um, idea for targeting, because I think we desperately need it. Um, but before I jump into that, I do kind of just, I do want to flag, I really appreciate you engaging with us with these questions, because I think for anyone who is considering careers in the <coughs> nuclear field, or who engages with nuclear weapons in any way, shape, or form, or even if you just read about them in the news, just take a beat and think about the ethical questions that are wrapped up in all of this. Um, because I, I, it, it's almost like it's a responsibility to have those kind of ethical engagements and those ethical questions. And if you think they're easy, go think about it a little bit longer. Because I think one of the most difficult ethical paradoxes that um, I, a lot of the folks in this field I think continue to struggle, struggle with it is the, the ethical paradox of nuclear deterrence itself, right? You are threatening, you are threatening to kill people. Um, you are threatening to destroy something. You are threatening to use a whole lot of force. But what if the act of the threat prevents uh, something really, really bad, potentially even worse from happening? That's a really hard, I, I find that to be a very difficult ethical question. Um, and I'm massively oversimplifying it, but that's why I would say go, like, go and think about it if you are considering a career in this field. Um, and what James's, um, kind of, James's argument really engages with some of those really hard questions, which is the type of targeting strategy that you have, if it increases the strength of deterrence, should we, should we support it? But what if it's actually not counterforce and actually it's targeting large civilian populations? And that's just, again, I'm, I'm massively oversimplifying it. Um, but it is all to say, I think the deterrence paradox is a much bigger question that, that's really hard to engage with. In terms of the targeting, yeah, I, I, I think this binary, if you're either, it's either a counterforce targeting or a counter value targeting, that's really a false binary. And James, I think, outlined some of the great re some of the reasons for that. And so this new approach that he is suggesting, I think, um, I really look forward to seeing the piece and kind of engaging with it and hearing how others engage with it. Um, if you are interested in these issues, I would highly recommend looking at um, some of the debates from way back in the day in the 1980s um, that uh, a lot of Christian um, uh, denominations got involved in nuclear deterrence debates. And um, as Carl knows, I've, I've been doing a lot of writing, a lot of thinking about this. But one of the arguments that came up um, was tied to just war doctrine, and it was this principle of double effect, which made the argument that if your intention is counterforce targeting, but there's a second order effect, which is killing a whole lot of civilians. Well, if your intention was the counterforce, but there were these knock-on effects, then it might be considered ethically acceptable. And this argument got a lot of traction in the targeting debates of the 80s, um, and I think it, it's still informed some of the just war thinking going on today. Um, but I, I kind of just offer that to talk not so much about the counterforce argument, which is a raging debate within the nuclear field right now, and really fascinating to see how it's evolving, but really to yeah. just kind of flag the bigger ethical question. And again, this issue touches on so many different ways of thinking about the world, so many dilemmas, so many disciplines. So if you are an attorney, if you're a philosopher, if you're an ethicist, you can also make a contribution to nuclear policy. If you work on public policy, if you work on psychology, if you think about how complex systems interact, we need you. We need new thinking on these issues, and we need some of the best and brightest people in our society thinking about this problem because the implications, the consequences are so great. Um, Francesca. Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to expand a little bit the debate here about targeting in nuclear ethics because it seems to me that there is also like a, a, a much broader question we should ask about, you know, nuclear ethics for whom? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so let me, let me just highlight a couple of things that came out of a study I, 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 I led a few years ago, actually, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So one of the fundamental questions I think we are grappling with today is, can nuclear deterrence ever be just? And so the question then is just for whom, right? And I fully agree with, with James that it seems to me that this very robotic way of understanding, you know, targeting is, is small arsenals, then you target cities, then you have large arsenal, you target military targets. This is not actually how really the thinking behind you know, nuclear deterrence should evolve or, or can evolve. <coughs> but I think there are real questions about targeting we should actually ask. The first one is uh, the United States made a very brave move to actually align the targeting policy to the international law. But the fundamental question I think that we are asking today is, well, what about other states? Right? What about non-democracies? 
How do non-democracies think about <coughs> legal commitments or moral commitments? Is China you know, feel constrained morally or ethically in their choice of targeting policy, right? And how does the legal constraint of international law play, for example, in North Korea on the Russian case? And so I think this is, this is an important debate to have because in some, in some uh, you know, areas of our community, the belief is, look, nuclear democracy is actually shooting themselves in the foot here. Right? I mean, we are actually all grappling with this important legal and ethical issues when actually your adversaries probably doesn't, don't care. So we should ask the question, does this make us strong? And if so, why? And why we should have this debate? I believe we should have them. But I, also, I, I believe we should also do some serious work on thinking about what are the constraints, legal and, and moral, that, for example, China abide by. Right? The assumption that these author authoritarian regimes don't care is just a very simplistic understanding. So we need to do more work about how do these countries see these constraints and how does it play in their own nuclear decision making. But then let me also throw in the mix a very important question that in my view we continue to skew uh, you know, left and right. What is the point of a, of numbers here, because James is absolutely right, and I think James, you are, you have another article talking about the fact that the nuclear arsenal of the United States right now is perfectly adequate to deter China and Russia. This madness of numbers is not in the historical tradition of the United States. The United States stopped caring about nuclear parity <coughs> with the Soviet Union long ago. Right? And in fact, it was McNamara during the Kennedy time that introduced the concept of sufficiency over parity. So we need to ask the question, what are the forces that drive today this need towards nuclear superiority again? I mean, why is this debate not settled, right? What is it that we are trying to respond to today? Why the numbers all of a sudden now come back and count? When for, for many years, in fact, the United States moved away from nuclear parity and the sufficiency argument was perfectly acceptable in the policy domain. So we need to look at the domestic factors, domestic politics dynamics to understand part of it. Part is driven by strategy, but part, remember guys, is driven by bureaucratic politics. Unless we understand the interest groups that, that you force these conversations, we will actually never, in my view, have a very clear picture. So domestic politics, bureaucratic politics, and strategy. Those are three explanations right. for why the US may want more nuclear weapons. Should point out last week we had the Strategic Posture Commission release their report. They stopped short of saying that the US needs more nuclear weapons, but they did say either more nuclear weapons or m weapons on more platforms or more other robust offsets in the face of China's nuclear arsenal, which is set to triple over the next 10, 15 years. Um, I don't know, uh, James or Heather, do you want to respond to Francesca's point? Why is sufficiency enough? Do we need parity? Do we need primacy? I guess I, I guess I disagree a little bit with Francesca on the history. I don't think we ever gave up with superiority. Um, you know, McNamara introduced this idea of sufficiency to curb numerical growth. It's true. What subsequently happened was, as the Soviets build up, you know, McNamara introduced that sufficiency, that criteria where we had massive nuclear superiority in terms of numbers over the Soviets. Once the Soviets started to build up and approach parity at the end of the 60s, we got really worried about it all of a sudden again. Um, and indeed, we've, we, we've always said second to none, right? That's, 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 that, that's long been a notion in US nuclear targeting strategy that, you know, we don't require a larger nuclear arsenal, but we ain't going to have a smaller one. Um, the other factor that happened during the Cold War was dramatic improvements in accuracy, right? We didn't, we did, we never gave up on nuclear superiority. We sought through greater accuracy the ability to undermine their arsenal with the same number of weapons. Because, um, you know, the more accurately you deliver the weapons, the higher your kill probability becomes, especially against these hardened targets like adversary silos. And so you need to uh, 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 target fewer nuclear weapons on each target. So, Unfortunately, I actually think ideas of superiority in one form or another have been inherent in US nuclear thinking for the entire nuclear age. What is interesting is how, is how most other nuclear armed states have not sought that. 
right? You know, the UK and France maintain very small arsenals. India and Pakistan are both growing, but neither of them have this obsession with numbers that we do. Israel's arsenal is very small. North Korea is never going to be able to compete numerically. China is now joining the US and Russia, in very unfortunately, I think, in its thinking. Yeah, um, go ahead, please. Um, and we'll just be brief. Because yeah, to... I'm going to be brief. James, but it is, I mean, if you look at the numbers in the, in the 70s, towards the end of the 70s, when there was a very clear pivot under Nixon towards, in fact, conventional capabilities, that was the moment where the United States really understood, look, nuclear parity, right, with the Soviet Union was, one, either going to bankrupt the country or basically make it, you know, adding one more weapon would have not necessarily resulted in, in a gigantic positive effect. Since the 70s, the United States didn't quite care about the Soviet Union going up to 60,000 nuclear weapons, right? And, they, and in my view, the emphasis has been very clearly on war fighting on conventional capabilities. This is where the United States really invested from the 70s on. So for me, I, I, I hear you. I think it's very true that there was a cohort in the policy community that always aspired to nuclear superiority. The question that I have for me and for you and for the nuclear community is why is this debate coming back today? When actually, let me also say this, and I know I'm going to, going to be controversial, <coughs> 1,500 nuclear weapons from China. We are not talking about the 60,000 of the Soviet Union here, right? So the numbers to me have created an inflation of threat that has disturbed me. And so the question is, why now? Why is this, this debate coming back now with numbers that, quite frankly, James, and you, are, you wrote very clearly in your piece, we can deter both the Russians and the Chinese with no problem. So the question is, why are we talking even about this? Oh, Francesca, don't get me wrong. You, you and I agree on this, right? <laughs> I know on the, we on do. The, on, on, on the big question about whether the US needs nuclear superiority, whether we should build up upon our current numbers, you, you and I are in 100% agreement that the answer to that ought to be no. You know, I think, I think we disagree a bit over the extent to which superiority has been part of the US yep. DNA, yep. but that's kind of more of a historical yep. footnote. Yep. But the main, my main point is to bring a lot of the people into this conversation who don't agree with either of you, who mm -hmm. believe that the US right. needs more nuclear weapons, and that conversation is going to happen. We're going to hear about this from Capitol Hill, yep. and it's going to become a major political issue. And this is a dynamic moment in the nuclear story. For the past 30 years or so, we have had a relatively benign threat environment mm -hmm. with regard to nuclear weapons, especially between the large powers. That mm -hmm. is changing, so buckle up. Um, we're going to miss the days when nuclear was boring. Um, and the question is, what do we do about it, mm -hmm. right? What are the policy solutions that we have? Because, you know, there's always unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. You try to do something to reduce risks, you may actually increase risks. So uh, I want to pose to you uh, Tom Khalil, who is a national treasure. Uh, he's put forward this experiment, this thought experiment called the magic laptop. Right, so I've asked you before this session, uh, here's how the magic laptop works. Um, the power is that any press release you write on this magic laptop will come true. Uh, you have to write the headline, several paragraphs to provide context, and a one or two paragraph description of who is agreeing to do what. Uh, the individuals can be federal agencies, they can be Congress, companies, philanthropists, investors, nonprofits, volunteers. Uh, and the constraint is that it has to be plausible that the organizations would be willing and able to take these actions. <coughs> so what is the magic laptop? What are you going to write on the magic laptop? We'll start with you, Heather. Before I tell you <laughs> on the magic laptop, you said you want people to engage who might disagree with what, well, I, I will raise my hand and say I, I actually do disagree. We, right. If people want to come back to the conversation about uh, about numbers and if we need more, I I'm, I'm kind of in the position of thinking we might need more. And I actually agree with the wording in the Strategic Posture Commission in saying responding to two peer competitors might require more numbers, it might require a different force structure or some combination of those. And I, I don't think it's so much about numbers, I think it's about options. And in this more complex environment with multiple adversaries, multiple scenarios, some of whom adversaries yeah. who have asymmetric and different capabilities, you might want the president to have more options. That might require more things. 
but we can come back to that. I would, I would mention too that more options is not always better and that based on how options are presented to a leader, yeah. the number of options and how they're couched <laughs> actually has a big, uh, it determines a lot of times which option is selected. So it's not just about which options there are, but how they're presented I and agree with that. how everything is framed. So, okay, you got the laptop. You got to write it quickly because my we're running out of time. And in 10 <laughs> minutes, we lose the laptop. And that so would be my, my headline says, Putin and Xi ask for immediate arms control. Say that again? Putin and Xi ask for immediate arms control. Um, I'm trying to keep this somewhat plausible. Yeah. Um, but if, you know, Putin conduct, if uh, the Kremlin conducts some sort of risk assessment of the war in Ukraine and says, do you know what? Nuclear risk was just too high. Um, this uh, breaking down of arms control does not serve our strategic benefits. We need to rebuild the arms control structure. And if Xi determines that per perhaps for economic reasons, it's time for China to get serious about arms control, that they put out to the United States, we want to engage in trilateral strategic stability dialogues, and we also want to have a new start follow-on before it expires, and we want to have a new um, architecture. And so what I would, um, in terms of who reacts to that, I would hope that, um, I think the Biden administration would respond the way that I'm hoping, which is immediately having a conversation, coordinate with the allies, because the allies might get antsy about some, about some of these ideas, um, and sit down and start <clears throat> rebuilding this arms control, um, this arms control architecture. That's great. And for those of you who don't know, Heather has written extensively about arms control and about the various forms of arms control, which in many ways are just ways to reduce risk and provide information on what's going on. So there's a wide variety. It doesn't, doesn't mean that the arms control is going to necessarily look like another new start agreement. There are things that we can do to make ourselves safer. Uh, James, you have the laptop. So firstly, can Longview buy it for me? <laughs> Secondly, you have to talk to Tom <laughs> Khalil. I think he's the only one with the proprietary technology. Secondly, my headline is US finally takes inadvertent escalation seriously. <laughs> Um, I've talked a lot already about what I see as the big risk of inadvertent escalation and entanglement, uh, you know, Chinese attacks against US dual use command and control capabilities. This is a much bigger problem than just this single issue to do with um, um, uh, early warning satellites. So my uh, proposal is that the President of the United States orders the Pentagon to make the number three official in the Pentagon, who's the Deputy uh, Secretary of, uh, uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, responsible for assessing risks of inadvertent escalation. And it's his or her job to assess those risks, to develop guidance for mitigating those risks, and to ensure that that guidance is implemented across the entire Pentagon. That is not to force any given policy. Any policy you make has trade-offs. But the purpose of this proposal is to ensure that inadvertent escalation is seriously considered alongside all of the other things the Pentagon is worried about. Because while some officials in the Pentagon will strongly dispute what I would, uh, I, I, I'm about to say, it does, we as a, we, uh, the US government, the United States, does not take that risk seriously at the moment, and in my opinion, largely ignores it in its planning. Thanks, James. Would you like to speak about some solutions? Yes, I actually want to play the magic laptop, uh, but okay. the magic paper. Right. <laughs> so my so my idea would be that Biden would announce that the uh, budget of State Department has increased of 10 percent, and new resources are finally flowing in into the diplomatic architecture of the United States. The reason for this is very obvious, and especially for us, you know, studying nuclear deterrence, you know. This debate has gone, in my view, a little bit too skewed towards capabilities and threats, right? So how do we threat mm. China? How do we threat North Korea? How do we deter and stuff? But if one actually read carefully, and you know, I think, James, you, you read Thomas Schelling better than anybody else here, so please feel free to, co to, to correct me. But if one take, for example, really the big thinkers of the 60s, the idea of deterrence was a balancing between reassurances and threats. Mm -hmm. So if I say to you, if you touch my laptop, I'm going to punch you in the face. Or if I say to you, if you touch my laptop, I'm going to punch you in the face. But if you don't, I won't. From there, there is a clear balancing. So you show your adversary that there is a cost, but there is also a benefit of not going you know, through with your action. Now, the reassurance piece is about communicating 
is about <coughs> being able to signal credibly, taking also really costly decisions diplomatically, right? You can't just reassure with words, you actually have to take costly signaling with your adversaries. And you can't ask the Pentagon to do that. This is not the job of the military. This has to be the job of the diplomats. This has to be the job of regional specialists. This has to be the job of the intelligence community. Because too often we don't remember the intelligence capabilities are a part of the deterrence ecosystem. So having analysts that understand how China thinks about a certain issue or how Russia perceives a certain type of threat to signal is indispensable. And so I would like to see a real refocusing on the diplomatic architecture, not because we are nice, but because we want to be strategic and we want to reinforce our deterrence ecosystem. Thank you. That's great. I want to talk a little bit about career opportunities with the final mm -hmm. minutes we have. We have about one minute each. Each of you work to mentor and to advise a lot of young people in this space, early career, mid-career. Um, Let's talk about what someone watching this talk might do in order to make a career in this issue. Should they even do it, and what would they do? Mm. Uh, Heather, why don't we talk with you? Sure. Um, three things. Uh, first thing is, no surprise, I'm going to say this, get involved in Pony. Um, Pony really is a fantastic network. It's how I first got started in the nuclear field. I presented at a Pony conference when I was 24, 25. And so being director now is still a little bit surreal. Um, but get involved in Pony, come to our conferences, um, check us out. Um, second thing that I would say is um, publish as early as you can. This is a piece of advice I wish someone had given to me earlier, um, that getting your name out there, getting your ideas out there, um, and putting like ideas down on paper is really the best way to kind of get involved in the community. And then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is that ideas are our currency that you are probably getting a whole bunch of adv career advice. Oh, go network. Oh, go get this degree. Yeah, those are all great ideas. You have to actually have ideas. That networking, that might get your foot in the door. Whether or not you stay in the room depends on the ideas that you have. And so spend time honing your craft, really engaging with these really hard issues and learning as much as you can. Um, and it, it really is a, a field that it is substance over style sometimes. I mean, some people have great style. Francesca obviously does. Um, and so... <laughs> and James. <laughs> James is wearing tweed. Well I done. Um, but so th that really is the, the main point yeah. I would want to say, which is like really engage with the ideas yeah. and why should you do it? You can actually save the world from nuclear war. Great. And if they wanted to apply to Pony, what should they do? Uh, you should go to the Pony website, uh, which is on CSIS, um, or you can go directly to our microsite, which is uh, www.nuclearnetworks.org. Uh, you might just want to drop into Google. Um, but we are having our 20th anniversary conference coming up in December. Um, and so you can apply to be a presenter at that conference. Um, and then we are also having a conference in the winter, I think in February. And so you can also be applying to present in that. And then lastly, very quickly, is we have an early career fellowship program called the Nuclear Scholar initiative, um, which a couple people around here I think have done at some point in time. Uh, we just closed applications, but if you're interested, then come talk to me at office hours. Great. James, quickly. Um, tell so firstly, if you want a career in nuclear policy, don't knock tweed. Secondly, <laughs> um, I love what I do. It is frustrating at times. This is an area in which you have to be prepared to bang your head against a brick wall to make those successes, but they do come occasionally, and you just got to be prepared for that. Join Pony, have a look at the Carnegie International Nuclear Policy Conference. Next one is in April 25. We have a young professionals track there. Most people who work in think tanks and do in the research role either have a significant uh, stint of government service or have a PhD. If, if, if you think that may apply to you, my advice is don't leave the PhD too long. You don't need mm -hmm. to rush into it, but it's much easier to get it out of the way sooner rather than later. And if you don't want to become an American political science professor at an American university, think about doing a PhD abroad. It's much quicker. Great. Right. Totally subscribe to this. Let me give you three um, really upcoming uh, opportunities. Uh, we lead this uh, school in, uh, in Italy on the Dolomites uh, first week of January called uh, Isso Darco. And it's a fantastic residential program. Everyone here has been a lecturer at Isso Darco. It's a really, really interesting community. We spend time together. You have free time to go skiing if you want. But then you actually really, you are in residence with all the lecturers and you have a lot of, you know, interaction on broad issues. This year is going to be on technological evolution and strategic stability. Um, so, this, so this is a school that's a one-week program in January. 
And for anyone in this room who's interested in nuclear, you would be a really good person to apply for this. So I, uh, I recommend that. And Francesca is organizing the course, so it's guaranteed to be good. <laughs> but uh, so let me build on what uh, James has said about the academic track. The academic track is a really important one. And I 100% agree with you, James. I did my PhD at Oxford because it was three years. And if you know that you don't necessarily want to be a 10-year track professor in political science, but you are interested in these topics, look at at King's College London, where Heather was teaching, you know, there are a lot of really, really outstanding PhD programs. Now, if you are in the academic track and you're interested in spending a year in an academic institution, there are various possibilities. Harvard Kennedy School <coughs> offers a nuclear fellowship. Uh, so we take uh, several uh, fellows with us for a year. MIT, Rand, Carnegie have various uh, nuclear fellowship, but you have to be a pre-doc or a, po a postdoc. Let me just mention also that international organizations have some interesting fellowships. I want to mention two in particular. One is the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, Marie Curie Fellowship. This is more for technical issues, so nuclear safety, nuclear non-proliferation, but really interesting, and it gives you a more technical skills that you might want to apply, especially if you are already a in, in a technical background. And then there is the UNODA Fellowship, the UN Office on Disarmament Affairs. That one I would caution, though, if you think you are more of a strategic thinker and you are not necessarily very interested in disarmament issues or in multi, uh, multilateral governance, that I wouldn't apply for that one. Wonderful. Uh, we have some great questions from the audience. I hope you'll have the chance to come to the office hours and ask these questions because I'd like to know the answer to them. Um, <laughs> and I, let's have a really warm round of applause for our panelists here.